Lord and rely on his God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure once again to uh, preach to you all this morning. I want to continue uh, that series that we began last week about victorious Christian living. We talked about how Christ changes us. How he brought a change in our heart and brings us the love of Christ that we share with one another. But this week, I have a different message. <clears throat> I'd like to start by talking about a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran priest, lived in Germany, and served the church in the 20s and 30s and then in the 40s. And he was a leader. He was a seminarian uh, professor. And as the rise of the Nazi party uh, caused the church to side with the world in Germany, he remained true to the word. And on April 9th, 1945, two weeks before the Flossenburg concentration camp was liberated, they executed Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They made him strip naked and walk calmly out to the gallows, his own gallows, where he was hanged until he was dead. It was a humiliating death. Yet an eyewitness said of him, I never saw a man go so calmly to his death. Truly, he submitted his whole will to that of God. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived as a true disciple of Christ. He died composed and calm. Why? Why did he die? so composed and calm. Which leads us to a question that, as followers of Christ, what should we expect from God? What did God do for, for Dietrich? To talk about this today, I'm going to talk about the, the Old Testament passage. Um, we often neglect the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is really amazingly integrated with the New Testament. Uh, that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about learning more about the Bible as I've dived into it, is that the Bible is so intricate and detailed and integrated, and yet it was written by the hand of so many different people over such a great span of time. It's amazing to me that anybody who reads it for any amount of time can't see that and understand and see the glory of God in it, in the hand of the Holy Spirit. It's a wonder that anybody can be an atheist after they've read the Bible. So what about Isaiah? You know, he was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Pat was talking uh, this morning about how he's one of her favorite authors in the Old Testament because it really got her attention when they said that he was put in the hollow log and sawed in two when she was a child. But he lived a long life. He served under four different kings of Judah, and he didn't hold back. He, uh, as she put it, trod on a lot of toes in the course of his ministry. So right before the passage today, he's talking, he, he's kind of cataloging and answering Jerusalem's complaints. You know, really complaints against God. But then after, um, he's talking about a promise. And that's kind of the way this part of Isaiah goes. It alternates between lamentations and, and castigations, if you will, and then promise from God, a hope for the future. And this particular passage is a hope for the future. Here, God tells us of the perseverance of his servant and how that informs us to his expectations. So again, I ask, what should we expect from God as Christians? <laughs> So in Isaiah 50, God tells us of at least three things we should expect from God. <clears throat> the first that we should expect is that he's going to equip us as disciples. Now, when Abby read the Old Testament lesson earlier, the phrase that she used was, as learned ones. But the actual word in the Old Testament means disciples. We've talked a little bit about discipleship in here before. Discipleship is more than just being a student. It's more than just being a worshiper. 
A disciple submits to the discipline of a teacher. Discipline obviously has the same root as disciple. A disciple is training to be a teacher. You know, it's very interesting that the word for disciple in the Old Testament is used very sparingly. It's actually used only in Isaiah and I think one other place. Uh, but it's used extensively in the New Testament. Because God wasn't really making disciples in the Old Testament. It was when Christ came to us that uh, he started the process of making disciples. So what's expected of disciples? What does Isaiah tell us about his expectations for disciples? Well, he says <clears throat> that um, he awakeneth morning by morning. Says that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He says, he wakeneth mine ear to hear the learned. In the New Testament lesson today, in the Gospel lesson, you notice that Jesus said very emphatically, let them who have ears hear. And he talks about those who it's not given to know the secrets of uh, the heavenly word, that they will not, they will hear, but they won't understand, basically, is what he said. And there's a lot in the Bible about that, that it's not given to everyone to see and understand. It's quite often the case that the Holy Spirit blinds people to the Word. It blinds people to the truth. And we are blessed to be able to understand His Word and to know it and to have it in our hearts. So what should we do with it then? Well, you know, being a disciple and having the ability to understand His Word is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And a gift from God like that, unlike His salvation, which He gives freely of His grace, comes with a price. And that price is that he expects us to use it. Now, there's lots of gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some of them are preaching and teaching. Um, some of us are given to healing. Some of us are given to speak in tongues. I haven't heard anyone speak in tongues in here, but that may yet happen. And it would be a blessing if it did. And some of us are given to the gift of interpretation of tongues. Some of us are given to um, the spirit of prophecy. So there's a number of gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you feel in your heart that you have a gift of the Holy Spirit, don't hide it. We're called to use it. We're called to comfort our brothers and sisters with the Word. We're called to daily devotion, morning by morning. I remember uh, years ago, uh, Bishop Hewitt was telling me about some great spiritual leader. He quite often, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of saints and great monastic leaders and leaders of the church. And he talked about this one, I think it was St. Francis, who said that every morning his first thought was of God before his feet even hit the floor. As soon as he opened his eyes, his first thought was of God, and he opened his day with a prayer to God. So daily devotion. So what else can we expect from God? We can expect suffering, he says. <clears throat> he says, I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a great disciple of Christ, we can expect humiliation. We can expect suffering. But yet, when Bonhoeffer was suffering, when he was at the height of his suffering in prison, what did he do? Like the Apostle Paul, he sought to convert those around him. In fact, if you're interested in Dietrich Bonhoeffer, there's a, there's a, uh, a book that he wrote from prison. It's a, it's a collection of letters, actually, called Letters from Prison. And in those letters, he talks about discipleship. He talks a lot about Jesus Christ. And how did those letters come to us? They came to us from sympathetic guards. Can you imagine that? In Nazi Germany, a prisoner of the highest security was helped by the guards around him. Some of the most fanatical men in the regime were those that helped him. So like Paul, he ministered to those around him and even converted them. 
perhaps that was why it was so important to them that they silence him even right before he was going to be liberated. But he says, he who vindicates me is near. So here is Isaiah writing probably somewhere around 700 years before Christ. And who is he talking about? We begin to get a hint that he's talking about the Messiah, about the suffering servant, you may have heard him called, about Jesus Christ. So what should we do with suffering when it's given to us? Should we wallow in self-pity and cry and moan about our fate? No. Suffering is meant to bring us closer to Christ. Maybe some of you remember from uh, the book of Acts when uh, Peter and I think it was John, I think it was John, uh, preached in the temple and they were punished by the Sanhedrin. They were beaten. And on their way from the temple after they were released, they rejoiced that they were found worthy to suffer in the name of Christ for preaching in his name. Now, I hope none of you get beaten. I hope I don't get beaten. But when we do suffer, whatever that form that suffering takes, we should become closer to Christ. Use your suffering. Turn it for the good of the church. So what else can we expect? Isaiah tells us, well, here's the good news. The good news of the gospel that when we suffer for our Lord and we have faith in our Lord, we can expect God to sustain us. We can expect Him to help us. For the Lord God will help me, he says in verse 7, Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Behold, he says, the Lord God helps me. And he talks about honoring God's servant. In fact, if you'll notice in this passage, four times he says, the Lord God, the sovereign God. Lord is most often used in the Bible to refer to Jesus. Because when he ascended into heaven, as Abby's been so faithfully studying all week in the Apostles' Creed, God set him on his right hand. He gave him lordship over all. So even 700 years before he came, Isaiah recognizes that the suffering servant is lord over all of us. So we're expected to honor Christ and obey him, he says. <clears throat> who, is, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? His chief servant, Jesus Christ. So what do we know about Jesus from the rest of the Bible? What did he promise us? That he would be with us always, even to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28 said that. So we can't earn this help other than by what? By faith in him. He says, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. If we trust in the Lord, if we have faith in Christ, God has promised that he will be with us even to the ends of the earth, always and even to the ends of the earth. So we show our love for Christ when we obey. We don't obey out of fear. We obey out of love. So we set out to answer the question, what should we expect from God as Christians? If we trust in Jesus, we can expect God to sustain us. So how can this knowledge help us in our quest to live victoriously through Christ? Accept the challenge to become a disciple. It's intimidating. It's easy to be a follower. It's not easy to be a leader. You know, they say 95% of us are sheep and 5% of us are sheepdogs. Some people say wolves, I prefer sheepdogs. It's hard to be a leader. David knows. Being a bishop is one of the hardest jobs. Because you're setting yourself above the people, well, not above the people, but before the people as a leader, helping to lead them to God, to defend the faith. To proclaim his word, 
in a world that doesn't want to hear his word. Seek to help others and sustain them through his word. When you see people are down, call them back to his word. There's so much in here that will sustain us in the Psalms. You know, I've been reading the Psalms a lot lately, and, and it's amazing how every day there's a different psalm called out in the morning prayer and the evening prayer, and they all speak to us, particularly in time of suffering and need. But even when you're not in suffering and need, they call us back. They call us back to what's important in life and call us away from the things that are unimportant. Abby was asking this morning about pomp. What does pomp mean? because she was reading about the promises of baptism in the, in the catechism. And it was talking about how the pomp, pomp is something of the devil. And that's what her sponsors in baptism promised to help her stay away from. You know? And you think about what are the signs of earthliness today? Everybody, all the celebrities and the government officials and the big corporate leaders, they have entourages. They speed through the city in limousines, and they don't regard us little people as they speed by with their, with their fancy escorts. When life gives us suffering, seek to use it to become closer to Christ. Because He can comfort us. He knows our needs before we even can articulate them. If we trust in Jesus, brothers and sisters, God will sustain us. He's promised to be with us always and everywhere. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.